with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Fresh eggs from your own backyard. I'm Nam Kiwanuka and tonight on the agenda this summer, we take another look at where chickens are and are not allowed to roost in Ontario. Also, after our week-long partnership with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario during their virtual conference, we wrap up the week with a report from our Ontario hubs on virtual city council meetings. Three years ago on TVO, we highlighted the growing but secretive trend of keeping chickens in big city backyards. As we celebrate our 50th anniversary this year, it's one of the stories from the archive we wanted to update. First, have a look at the original item. Where are the chickens? They're pretty and cute. As cute as the chickens may be, the chickens belong in the barnyard or on a farm, not in my backyard or my neighbor's backyard. Backyard hens are everywhere in the city. I have absolutely no concept of how many. The whole experience of backyard hens is clandestine. People do not tell their neighbors. Backyard hens are allowed in several Ontario cities and towns. In Kingston, Quinty West, Niagara Falls, Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Brampton. Both Sudbury and Hamilton are reviewing their policies. Toronto voted against reviewing a bylaw change in 2012. My original motivation is just curiosity, but now it's more about letting the children see where eggs come from, some of their food supply, mm -hmm. and understanding a bit more about how animals are cared for. I've always wanted to know what it's like to be a farmer, and chickens are like, good to start with. People will say, well, all I'm trying to do is educate my kids about where their food comes from, and my response is, great, you're a good parent, and I congratulate you for doing that. Teach your kids how to grow a watermelon, or a cabbage, or beans, or tomatoes. There's 101 vegetables you can grow that educate your children. To say that I have to have a chicken so that my, chi my children know where meat comes from, I would say, well, you're not really telling them the truth. You have to slaughter that chicken in front of your children, and then your children will know where their chicken wings come from. And you guys are going to help take care of the chickens, right? Yes. Okay. I've never actually been so close that I can actually touch the chickens and I, it makes me like feel kind of mm, weird that I've, I've actually eaten chickens. It's okay, Jasmine. We don't have to eat these chickens right away, don't worry. Mm, I promise. I don't think we're supposed to eat them. They might be upset with us. Good job. So now you guys know how to feed your chickens. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Yeah. Just give them one scoop in each feeder every morning, and that's it. Chickens are actually really, really low maintenance. They're easy to look after, so they need their food once a day. Uh, they need their water kept full, and you need to collect the eggs. Um, you probably have to clean the shavings out of the run area probably once a week. We deliver the hens, uh, the coop, all the feed that's required for the season, um, feeders and waterers to the renter. They get to enjoy having the hens and the fresh eggs from the backyard from May through to about November, at which point we'll pick them up and we bring them back to the farm. Some poop there, there's some poop over there. Eww, salmonella. It's something that can happen, so you want to do your very best to make sure it doesn't by making sure you wash your hands really well. This is a community of locavores and backyard hens are part of that movement. I'm a strong supporter of uh, backyard hens uh, within a limited quantity that would not include roosters. It's about time that we change the bylaw uh, around backyard hens. We allow pigeons, we allow rabbits, we allow cats, we allow dogs. Why are hens excluded from the animals that are allowed uh, in, our, in our backyards?
Having chickens in your backyard creates a, a, a whole can of worms uh, for the City of Toronto because one person will say, well, I want just one chicken. Then their neighbour will say, well, I want two chickens. Somebody else will want 12 chickens. And someone will say, yeah, but we'll put a limit of only two chickens per, per backyard. Well, how does the city enforce that? Do we hire chicken police so that chicken police will knock on your door and say, Mrs. Smith, we've had an anonymous complaint about your backyard. You've got 12 chickens when you're only supposed to have two chickens. It's time for coop cleaning. I hate coop cleaning. It's disgusting. Go get the stuffing. Okay. It doesn't smell that much because it was cleaned a few days ago. But if you don't clean it for a long time, it smells very bad. We're done. We used to have backyard chickens that we had to get rid of because there was a bylaw complaint set against us by one of our neighbors. We got them when they were little chicks, we watched them grow up, we waited six months for the wonderful day when we finally came out one morning and there was eggs under their little bums. Like, you know, when you tell people, oh yeah, I have chickens, like, you know, my friends would come over and look at them and it was, it was like, we kind of had like the zoo almost. Our house was like, people would come, all the neighbors liked to see them and we'd give out our eggs. It was amazing. I remember it so well. It was a really great experience. You were so happy. We loved them so much. She would let them out and they would just run around our backyard, like looking for bugs and stuff in the grass. That was her favorite thing to do. Most people are going to say, it's a chicken, and the chicken likes to run around. And when I go to work, I just leave him out there. But what happens when your neighbor's dog or your dog or, so, or a raccoon or a fox comes and kills that poor little chicken with it screaming and crying, uh, running around like its head's been cut off, and the neighbor's kids have to hear that. And then one morning, I think you were in bed, and you heard like a child screaming. And so you were like, whose kid is like screaming at, you know, seven o'clock in the morning? And then she realized, no, that's our, that's our rooster. It was like, it was like Arr! stretching its lungs. Yeah. You know, it was just sort of practicing. So we took care of that very quickly. We took him back to the farm. The lady was great about switching him out. And then we got a, a female. <laughs> I'm not worried about a good person and a good owner with a chicken. It's the bad owner that we're worried about. So uh, chickens smell. They really stink. And if you've ever been to a, a chicken coop, you know the smell will knock you out. It is a disgusting smell. Yeah. Maybe if we're producing 3%, 5% of our food right now in an urban setting, maybe we could up that to 5% to 10%. Allowing opportunities for people to grow their own food and to domesticate hens for their own personal use, I think that's a, an important contribution that uh, the cities of the future will need to consider. Two eggs. What you have when you have chickens in the backyard is sometimes you'll have people slaughtering those chickens. And when somebody complains and says, send out an inspector, well, the chickens were all killed on Sunday afternoon. Our inspector shows up Monday afternoon, no chickens left, just feathers. I'm gonna do it on the other arm this time. <laughs> Good training day. <laughs> we started on sticks, then we did the arms. Then we did the trapeze bar. Then we began swinging the trapeze bar. <laughs> and after they've been doing tricks, they get to stand in the hostas and eat the hostas. It's hard to sit down and eat chicken after you have pet chickens. It's like, it's almost heartbreaking. And so that I think had a huge impact on my decision to be vegetarian and my sister's decision to become vegan. So both of us have made dietary changes because of, I think, the chickens. And the bunnies, like I, any animal, I don't think I would eat any animal. In the United States, you have all the big cities, virtually all the big cities, allow uh, backyard, uh, backyard hens, including the New Yorks and the Los Angeleses and the Dallases uh, of the world. Every year or two, it sort of uh, pops up and every year or two it's batted back down. So right now there's no status at the City of Toronto. You are not allowed to keep chickens in your backyard. Chickens are and backyard hens are everywhere in the city. 
So it, it's very much clandestine right now, and that's actually not so good. <laughs> because you want to be able to provide an educational environment, especially for those who don't know how to take care of chickens. But right now it's very hard to provide that because people don't want public officials to know that they, they have backyard hens. Regrets, no, I think it was a great experience. I know it was illegal, but it, it's not like I was robbing anybody or something really illegal. If it's your own property, why can't you do this? Why does the city have to micromanage everything? Um, and don't they have bigger things to worry about than chickens? I'm just saying. I would do it. I would put them right there in that corner. My fear in life is just that my tombstone is going to read, Here lies the chicken dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad that they're leaving, but I'm happy that I don't need to clean the coop anymore. There's one thing that I really didn't like in my backyard this year, and that was more flies, a lot more flies. It did smell more farm than it used to, and I attribute that to the additional poo. We cleaned it up and put it into the leaf compost and stirred the compost, and it didn't seem to ever really get gross. The most important thing I learned from the chickens is that they actually stand up to lay their eggs. And they stand up to lay their eyes so that they don't crush it. Bye, girl. Bye. I'll see you next summer. Bye, girl. See you. Of course, when that was produced, there was no pandemic or COVID-induced impulses to farm wherever people could find space. Charnel Anderson covers the northwestern part of the province for Ontario Hubs. She's been checking up on the backyard chicken situation in the province, and she joins us now from Red Rock on the shores of Lake Superior for more. Hi, Charnel. Hi, Nam. I hope we get to see your cat, Meow. Uh, it's really nice to see you. Right, yeah. So Chanel, let's start in Toronto. Um, are we allowed to have chickens in our backyards? You sure are. That is, if you're lucky enough to live in one of the four wards that allow them. Um, in 2017, Toronto City Council approved the Urban Hens TO um, pilot project, which officially began in March 2018. Um, so some of the rules uh, for residents who live in one of those four wards, you're allowed up to four hens, but no roosters. I don't know if you know this, Nam, but roosters crow all day and night. Um, so they're not allowed. Um, I don't mind the sound, but I, I can see how it could get annoying. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So only hens and those hens must be uh, four months old. And there's two reasons for this. One is because uh, at four months old is when you can tell whether it's a rooster or a hen, because you can't tell just by looking at a chick. Um, the other reason is, you know, they're worried about people um, getting rid of the chickens after they're no longer cute and fuzzy little chicks. Um, as well, the hens can only be used for egg production. So you're not allowed to eat them um, and those eggs must be uh, used for personal consumption so you're not allowed to either sell them or give them away to anyone else. Um, now to give you an idea of how many people are participating in the program, um, according to an article published by the Toronto Star in July, there are a total of 230 hens in Toronto at um, 79 different households. So the project is scheduled to run until March of next year, but of course people are starting to wonder what's gonna happen. Um, according to the Toronto Star, uh, advocates of the program have started a petition asking the city to expand and extend uh, the pilot project. Um, in that same article, the City of Toronto Media Relations said that they are preparing um, a report on the pilot project, which should go before council in September. So we should know more about the fate of the uh, pilot project soon. And you mentioned that uh, if you do live in Toronto, you are allowed to have chickens in your backyard as long as you live in four wards. Why only those wards? Right. So it's only four out of, 
you know, possible 25 wards. Um, these wards include Ward 5, Etobicoke Lakeshore, Ward 13, Parkdale High Park, Ward 21, St. Paul's, and Ward 32, Beaches, East York. Um, so something to keep in mind is that these are the wards before the boundaries were um, restructured in 2018. So for example, if you lived in uh, Bloor West Village, which is now part of Parkdale High Park, um, it doesn't matter, you know, the project only runs within uh, the old ward boundaries. And I think there's two reasons for this. One is because, um, you know, the counselors who supported this project lived in those four wards. So, for example, Joe Mahevic in Ward 21. Um, as well, the other reason, I think, uh, is just because these wards tend to have more room. You know, there's larger backyards, more room for um, a chicken coop. Um, also, like you mentioned that people are asking for this pilot project to be extended. Have there been any complaints about the project? Now, so this may come as a surprise as uh, to a lot of backyard chicken naysayers because no, there really haven't been um, any complaints of real significance at all. Uh, so back in May, I was working on a story um, about backyard chickens in Thunder Bay and I asked the city of Toronto how many complaints they received and they said they received uh, they've received a total of 36 complaints, but these complaints are related to a prohibited animal. Um, so that's people who have a chicken but don't live within the ward boundaries. Um, another thing people are worried about is disease. So stuff like salmonella or campylobacter, it can happen. But um, according to the city of Toronto, they haven't, they're not aware of any disease outbreaks at all. Um, you also mentioned in the piece that Hamilton and a few other jurisdictions were contemplating allowing chickens. Um, any updates on that? Right. So at the time this documentary was produced, um, both Hamilton and Sudbury were looking at uh, reviewing their uh, backyard chicken bylaws. Um, but they both since chickened out. Um, <laughs> I love that. According to CB... <laughs> Um, so according to CBC News and Sudbury, they were concerned about the chickens attracting bears and other predators. Um, and in Hamilton, the counselors were worried about people not taking care of their chickens and receiving complaints, which are, you know, those are pretty common um, arguments you hear against backyard chickens. What about other cities and towns in Ontario? Um, so there are quite a few mu municipalities in Ontario that do allow uh, backyard chickens. Some of them were mentioned in the, in the documentary. So places like uh, Kingston, Niagara Falls, Orillia, Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo, uh, Brampton, they all allow backyard chickens. Um, but the rules do vary by municipalities. So, you know, for someone who may be interested uh, in getting chickens, you got to look at um, your bylaws. What about where you are in northern Ontario? So this is something that kind of surprised me because uh, for the most part, uh, backyard chickens are not allowed in the majority of communities in Northern Ontario. Why did that um, surprise you? Well, you would think because there's more space, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's less dense. There's more room for chickens. Mm -hmm. But um, so there is a little bit of nuance to that um, because, for example, in Sudbury, I mentioned uh, that they voted against backyard chickens in 2018. However, if you are living in Sudbury and you're on a property that's like one acre, um, it's totally fine. You can have backyard chickens. Um, and it's a, similar uh, it's a similar situation in Thunder Bay as well, but it's related to zoning. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a residentially zoned um, property, which if you're living in a house in the city, it's likely residential, then you're not allowed chickens. But if it's a rural zoned property, then you can have chickens. Um, there is one community in North Bay uh, called Powassan who uh, approved backyard chickens this year. But as I said, you know, that's more the exception uh, and not the rule. Do you think this, you know, uh, with COVID-19, I mean, I actually baked a loaf of bread. <laughs> Me. <laughs> um, and people are more aware of where their food is coming from. Uh, people are trying to grow their own food. Has the pandemic affected this issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the pandemic has really put a spotlight on food security. Um, if you think uh, back in the spring, the meat packing plant, uh, sorry, the meat processing plant in Alberta, um, they shut it down for two weeks because almost a thousand employees got COVID-19. And that kind of got me thinking about, you know, the strength of our um, food supply chains in, and their ability to kind of weather a storm like this. Because uh, in Thunder Bay, for example, food travels over 2,000 kilometers to get here. You know, we don't have the big depot like you guys do in Toronto. Um, 
so this spring, the Thunder Bay City Councilor, Shelby Chung, who put forth the motion to get counsel to revisit backyard chickens, that was her argument. You know, she said that backyard chickens would help increase food security for residents in Thunder Bay. Because you think about it, instead of, you know, having to go to the grocery store and paying five bucks for a carton of eggs, you can just walk out your back door and grab a couple of freshly laid eggs for breakfast. Um, but Thunder Bay City Council didn't agree, and they ultimately voted against the motion 10 to 3. Um, and I think, you know, they were kind of worried about other pandemic-related issues at that time. Uh, as for, you know, the issue of backyard, chicken and food, backyard chickens and food security, I think there's good arguments to be made on both sides, right? Because on one hand, chickens supply a steady, um, you know, relatively steady supply of eggs, and you can also eat them if you're so inclined. Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of upfront costs that come with if you've never raised chickens before. Like so, the coop, the cost of the coop, right? Yeah, exactly. It can cost a couple hundred up to a thousand dollars. And especially if you're gonna keep the chickens over winter because you know they gotta stay warm. Um, Covering this story, um, because we were talking about it before we went, um, to, when we started this segment, do you, do you find it surprising how divisive this issue is? Uh, it does tend to be quite a contentious issue, and it's often neighbors who are calling and complaining about their other neighbors who have chickens because um, a lot of the arguments against chickens are that they're noisy, they smell, they attract predators, um, you know, there's poten the potential for disease. But then you look at something like the Urban Hens TO pilot project where it really, you know, there's virtually no complaints in a city as dense as Toronto. So. Well, thank you so much for giving us the update, Charnel. We'll be following the story, and it was nice to see you. Finally, we did a segment yeah, together. Yay! <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Whatever the pandemic requires, cities and towns across the province still need to do the public's business in public. All week, TVO partnered with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario as they conducted their annual conference virtually. That's also how municipal councils have been doing some of their work. Justin Chandler covers the Hamilton-Niagara region for Ontario Hubs. He joins us now from Toronto to explain. Welcome to the show, Justin. Oh, thank you so much. So you've been chatting with some councillors and mayors while they've been doing some of the virtual work. Uh, what do they say is different from the virtual stuff than in-person meetings? Well, they, they say that really you're not getting the same nuance and the same energy that you do in person. I think as everyone knows from doing so many video calls lately, um, you can see someone, you can hear the tone of their voice, but there's maybe just not the same energy or the same presence that you get. In fact, uh, the mayor of Niagara Falls, Jim Diodati, says it's the difference between eating a steak and watching a video of a steak. That's a very big difference. Now, I'm sure there are some counselors, of course, who are um, encouraged by this and actually quite like the online. Let's talk about some of the benefits uh, of online council meetings. Yes, well, in Niagara Falls, they've been meeting in person, uh, except for one counselor, uh, Carolyn Iannone. And now that the new rules allow uh, her to actually participate um, while not being present, uh, she's able to do this from home, which has been good for her because she's actually undergoing cancer treatment. Uh, and the mayor of Niagara Falls himself uh, did the same a couple of years ago, and he said that he wished that that would have been an opportunity for him. So it's allowed counselors who maybe for legitimate reasons beforehand uh, would not have been able to participate to actually be able to go in and still do their work. Now, you also mentioned there are some drawbacks, of course, with, with that stake uh, uh, metaphor there. But uh, what are their kind of drawbacks, um, are councillors and mayors saying? Well, it's, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Some say that uh, the decorum has actually gotten better, but in Hamilton, the mayor said, maybe it's gotten slightly more aggressive now that people are on video, that it's a little bit harder for the chair to point out if uh, someone's gone a little bit too far in their comments or is maybe uh, not respecting the decorum that they might usually. Now, in your story for TVO.org, you spoke to a number of, uh, of councils. Let's get an idea, obviously. It, does, it seems like there's a different approach to different councils, where in Niagara, it's online um, and in person, but other councils and in, in, in other cities and municipalities are, are doing differently. So uh, what's the kind of, what have you seen? 
Uh, well, Guelph, for example, has been doing primarily online. Uh, they were also very quick to get public consultations happening online. Uh, Hamilton's been online. Uh, however, they only just started doing public consultation. And there's been quite a mix as far as the different technologies that groups use uh, and how rapidly they rolled them out. I was even told one story about a council where they just put out chairs and spaced out uh, so they could talk to one another at the start of all this. Um, of course, as journalists, you know, we've covered council meetings before. Some of the, some of the best council meetings is when the public gets involved as well. Uh, can members mm -hmm. of the public still attend these virtual uh, council meetings? And, you know, have you seen any of the passion come through at all? Yes, I think there, there can still be good moments. People can give a, a passionate speech by video. Uh, and a lot of people now who maybe were not willing or could not go down to council and wait all day to speak before a meeting are now able to. However, there's still a limitation. For example, Hamilton in September is going to be hearing uh, delegations about defunding police. And you might think in a normal year that would be something where people might pack city council and they might have signs, there might be cheering while people are talking, there might be booing. Uh, however, now that'll be happening virtually so it's much more one-on-one -on, -one on a video screen so you don't get um, perhaps the same level of in-person engagement that you could beforehand. And Justin in your article for TVO.org you had written about uh, town council in Ottawa uh, they were able to actually add some features by using some of this technology as well. Yes, they were actually very excited that for media availabilities and for town halls, they were able now to have sign language interpreters in English and in French, uh, which was great, something they couldn't do beforehand. But now they're able to provide that more accessible option because they can have multiple people on the screen at once, given that they're able to take more advantage of this technology. Now, one thing I think a number of councillors have remarked and, and we as journalists have remarked is, you know, this technology has been available. We know that some councils record their meetings as well and, you know, post it online. Do you think municipalities will continue to utilize um, this type of technology post COVID-19? I think so. Even people who said that they prefer in-person meetings, which was pretty much everybody, um, said that there is something to physically going to a place and seeing uh, democracy happen and seeing local government actually work. Uh, so I think that these virtual meetings will be a tool that they continue to use. But I think that as soon as possible, people will want to get back and actually hold these meetings in person. Justin, I want to thank you so much. That's Justin Chandler, our Ontario Hub journalist covering the Hamilton and Niagara region. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Jan Jagnothan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend and Nam, we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.